Greetings, and thank you for joining us for another SANS ICS Hot Takes video. In this video, the SANS ICS team is joined by Brandon Evans. Brandon leads the Internal Application Security Training Program for Zoom Video Communications. He is also a certified SANS instructor, developing and teaching several of the SANS Cloud classes. In this video, we talk with Brandon about the challenges organizations face when integrating cloud services into the control network. We cover security requirements, data collection, service management, and other issues relating to selecting a cloud service provider or integrating a cloud service. If you enjoy the SANS ICS Hot Take series, please like and subscribe to this channel. If you have ideas for future content, please leave a comment below or reach out to us on the SANS ICS forum. Thank you everybody for joining us for another SANS ICS Hot Takes. Uh, I'm Don C. Weber of Cutaway Security. I teach the ICS 410 class. Uh, Jeff, can you introduce yourself? Yes, I, my name is Jeff Shear. I am a SANS uh, co-author and instructor of ICS 612. And I also uh, do other cybersecurity work for SANS. Excellent, Jason? Hi, uh, Jason Dealey, uh, also a SANS uh, instructor for ICS 515 and course author instructor for ICS 612. Um, I also do a lot of work on the curriculum for SANS as well as uh, for my business, uh, Northern Strong Security out of Canada. Excellent. And today we wanted to talk about cloud security and some of the challenges around that. And we've asked Brandon to join us. Uh, Brandon, why don't you let everybody know a little bit about yourself? Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. My name is Brandon Evans. I am a certified instructor for the SANS Institute and the author, one of the two authors for SEC 510, Public Cloud Security, AWS, Azure, and GCP. And in my day job, I work as a senior application security engineer at Zoom. Oh, excellent. Excellent. And thanks, you know, once again, Brandon, thanks for joining us. You know, the reason why I wanted to talk about this is because Implementing cloud is such a challenge in and of itself, but when we're talking about control networks, when we're talking about industrial environments, uh, we're talking about a technology that people aren't familiar with, and yet we're having vendors ask us to connect our control networks to the cloud. We're having integrators that are doing this. Uh, people are uh, purchasing um, equipment such as uh, battery systems that have the requirement for cloud connectivity. And when organizations don't understand the technology, they don't know the requirements they should be putting on those. So Brandon, you know, let, let's start it off. If you can let us know where people can be turning to, to kind of help them understand some of the requirements they should be asking of these people that are telling them that, hey, you need to connect to the cloud. Certainly. So in the vast majority of cases, Cloud services can be secured as long as you have the appropriate configuration. We're not finding a whole lot of zero days in S3 at this point. We're really finding misconfiguration of various cloud services. So the Center for Internet Security or CIS has provided a series of benchmarks for all three of the major cloud providers, AWS, Azure, and GCP. And they show how oftentimes people commonly misconfigure these services or the configurations are oftentimes insecure by default. And, and that would make sense, right? These cloud providers want to make it easy for you to get started. So they'll oftentimes do things like put administrative ports on the public internet, ports 22 and the RDP ports. They'll oftentimes give you a lot of permissions to get started with so you can interoperate with other services in the cloud. And that's really good for someone wanting to experiment, but terrible for an enterprise. So it's important to look at those benchmarks and see how we can taper down those permissions. And the CIS benchmarks cover a lot of great topics, including identity and access management, networking, encryption, virtual machines, storage services, and much, much more. So I think that's a great place to get started. Now, I, I've heard about the Cloud Security Alliance or uh, Cloud Security Consortium. Is, is that a, another place? Are you familiar with that? I'm familiar with that. I'm not super familiar with the white papers or research that they've done, but there's a lot of work in this space. The cloud is very new and security, as you know, is oftentimes way behind the industry. So it's great that a lot of different groups are getting involved uh, with uh, cloud security research. Absolutely. 
Uh, Jeff, I know you had a lot of questions about some of the things that you've seen implemented within the control networks. You want to start it off? Sure, absolutely. You know, at the end of the day, an industrial facility is there to make a product and industrial security is all about making sure all the machinery and all the processes work as intended. Um, what I've seen is some appliances that are actually being placed down into the industrial side and customers are wondering like, how do I actually get, for instance, license files so that I, I have purchased this device, uh, I've gotten my personality file or I've got my, my license file. And so now it needs to continue to report analytics or whatever. Um, some, of the, some of the challenges that we face is we have some customers that say, you can't hop one Purdue model uh, you can't hop two Purdue models, uh, excuse me, you can't hop more than one Purdue model. For instance, you can't go from level one to level three or four. And so the challenges that, that we have is how do we actually meet those kind of requirements in an environment where they won't let us do that? So questions to Brandon is, have you seen any customer specific requirements? Uh, and then how do you, how do you advise someone in, in that space? Well, for a little bit of context, I, I don't do a whole lot of contract work in my line of work. I've worked for a handful of companies. I, I did work for one company that was an IoT surveillance company, and we worked to integrate software onto cameras and network video recorders to ensure corporate security, corporate physical security. Uh, but that was definitely to a different level than what you're describing. I don't think I would trust my code for oil fields, for example. Mm -hmm. So I am not certain what requirements uh, certain pieces of software would have. I would certainly say that it has to adapt to that environment. You don't want to have the ability to access administrative consoles remotely for oil fields. It's just not something that is going to work. So in some cases, you may have to work with the vendor to change those requirements because you simply can't enforce the same requirements as you'd have for like a web service. Uh, it's just a completely different environment. The, uh, so the takeaway here for me listening to you as a, as a cloud security expert is that I need to have someone on my team that understands that connectivity. And then secondly, I also need to understand that that appliance that wants to connect to the cloud can't reach beyond its little scope. So if it's, uh, for instance, if it's doing analytics and it's reading from ICS devices, we want to make sure that that doesn't creep out into reading and writing those devices. And so we need to work together to actually understand those requirements. And you would bring something to the table that I would never think about while I would keep in my little scope of trying to say, what is this device supposed to do? Well, one way you can test this very easily is lock down your network according to your requirements and then see what breaks. Mm -hmm. um, that's potentially acceptable, potentially unacceptable, depending on the criticality of the device and how it's configured. I would certainly want to make sure that the device isn't going to, you know, collapse a nuclear uh, facility if it's not getting network connection. Hopefully there are fail safes anyway, because we know that networks go down all the time. Uh, but that's one way you can certainly do it is just meet your requirements through network configuration and then see what capabilities work, what capabilities don't work. And if the answer is they don't work, um, then talk to the vendor and see if there's any ways around that. So, so and you know, to kind of get to Jeff's point kind of reminded me of some of the concerns people are gonna have. And a part of that concern is that when you think about the cloud, a lot of people associate that with a public network. And people are going to be concerned about coming down from those cloud uh, resources into the control network and being able to get persistence and propagate uh, on the control network. So uh, have you seen this or have you heard about this within the corporate network, people being able to compromise those cloud assets and gain access to companies? Well, certainly, but that's a misconfiguration, right? We can isolate network resources in the cloud. That's one of the fundamental building blocks for the different cloud providers. You have virtual private clouds in AWS and GCP. They call them virtual networks in Azure. And you can isolate those resources 
logically from all the other resources in the cloud and then determine what access, if any public access should be granted to those pieces of infrastructure. You may say these virtual machines exist on a private subnet, one that does not have an internet gateway and there's no way to access it from outside of that private subnet. You may want to configure your VPN to bridge into that private subnet so that you can do some kind of administration or you may just say this service is not accessible from the public internet. It's interacted with through a service that is in the public internet that proxies to that private service. So you have the same controls that you have on premises. You're just trusting that the cloud providers have implemented those strategies or those mechanisms properly. And as I said in the beginning, we haven't seen a lot of zero days with these cloud providers. So yes, we're making a leap of faith, but it's one that is warranted through so much experimentation across the industry. If another company was compromised through a zero day in AWS VPC, you'd probably hear about it before it affects you. So that may be something that people are uncomfortable with at a you know philosophical level, but it's one that I would trust over relying on on-premises configuration because humans on-premises make mistakes too. It's not just the third party cloud provider, it's also your internal team. And as more people are going in the cloud, there's less people who have that skill set anyway. So I'd rather rely on the expertise of the people managing these services at such a tremendous scale then try to reinvent the wheel myself. So there's, you, you bring up a lot of stuff in that. And I think that, um, you know, we're talking about a trust. And I think the thing is, is that, um, you know, if we're looking at uh, an organization that's trying to adopt cloud for, now cloud fits into multiple roles for an ICS, right? It could be, for data collection analytics, it could be they're using a cloud-based ERP. It could be that they're using um, a, a, a small municipality and using it for some of their SCADA function. It could be uh, they're relying on um, a vendor to to provide some kind of service, or um, actually, or even just using Zoom to try to help them troubleshoot kind of thing. So the thing is that I think there's 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 a level of of trust that needs to be built up, and I think Jeff. Jeff kind of brought up an interesting point, which is, you know, how do we bring, it's like in that conversation, when you're trying to evaluate the risks, the pros, the cons, I think there's like, in general, this natural um, idea that because it's cloud, it's not trusted. And, and you're kind of, you know, standing against that because, you know, for the reasons given. And I think that's an important piece that, you know, when you're going down these projects is to pull in people that are aware. The one thing that I think helps with that or definitely throws in the face of a bit of that trust is when you're doing a, there's, there's multiple layers of people or companies involved with a cloud solution, right? And, and you talk about misconfiguration. And I think that's one of the areas where, you know, people get kind of, um, uncertain or unaware of or just ignorance which you know i say with respect the you've got the cloud provider and they're providing a level of care you have the you know the application or the solution sitting on top of that and it provides a level and then you have the integration between those two and some level of you know protected tunnel in order to move that data or that connection and i think the thing is it's like how how does an organization go about unwinding each of those to validate that everybody's doing what they're supposed to do before they make the final decision. And I would paraphrase all of that with, fundamentally, there needs to be an understanding of the organization that there's a, there's a, a, a use case that definitely makes cloud an attractive piece, not just because of cost for you know, maintaining servers, but all the other stuff around it. Anyways, I think that's, you know, but unraveling that, you know, th those different layers of, of people or interaction of companies, you know, that's, I think, a hard part to, to describe because one would look at AWS and say, it's AWS. I mean, if they have a problem, they, they, their, their, relate, or their, uh, their level of respect is going to drop because they have so many people. But you know, X, Y company that's producing, you know, such and such analytic engine that pulls data from 
uh, oil field, for an example, um, how do we know that they've done it right? How do they know that we they, they twisted and dialed all the different things inside the AWS to make their application secure? Like, how, how do we walk through that? Certainly. So to get back to one of the things you mentioned earlier about there, there's really two things that we care about when it comes to the cloud. We care about what the cloud providers are doing and what we're doing within the cloud. And there's actually a term for this in AWS. They call it the shared responsibility model. So at a very high level, AWS is responsible for the security of the cloud. We are responsible for the security that happens in the cloud. We are responsible for the security of the data in the cloud, as well as the applications in the cloud. And that's more or less where the division of labor happens here. Now, in terms of the security of the cloud, yes, there's always going to be that leap of faith. We all know as security experts that the only secure machine is one that is unplugged, probably destroyed. And we have to make a compromise between functionality and security. We know there's no such thing as 100% security, but we also don't want to take these cloud providers for their word. We want to evaluate them through the vendor selection process. We want to look at their white papers. We want to study their infrastructure. And we can read a lot of the research that's been done from offensive security folks interacting with different cloud services. There have been many examples of individuals hacking cloud services in a way that was not only allowed, but encouraged by the cloud providers. For example, there was a issue that was found in the Google Cloud Shell that was found by a security researcher. It got reported to the bug bounty program and I think they paid out about $200,000 for that vulnerability. Now, that's good. We're learning things that are going wrong in these different cloud providers. I would say that AWS and Azure have a substantially higher level of maturity than Google Cloud does at this point, simply because more eyes have been on it. I'll, I'll give one example. The Capital One breach that happened in July of 2019. That breach happened through a confluence of different factors, but one of the things that AWS did wrong was having an insecure instance metadata service. And if you want to learn what that's about, you can look at some of the talks that I've given for SEC 510. There's a lot of details there. But the important thing to take away from that is that AWS had an issue that Google Cloud literally had the exact same issue. They had an insecure instance metadata service, but we only noticed it for AWS because Capital One was using AWS versus GCP. So if you're going to use a cloud that is not one of the, I would say, two most mature ones, AWS and Azure, you definitely want to give it a higher level of scrutiny and do additional research. But Odds are you're going to use a combination of cloud providers anyway, and there's a variety of reasons uh, why people do that, and it's one of the foundations of the course I've written. One thing I want to say before I forget, though, is I'm not letting AWS off the hook here. AWS has vulnerabilities, too. They're not quite as serious as you know a zero day in S3 where authorization is just completely busted. That would be really, really obvious to the entire world um, if that had happened. But I actually found an issue with the AWS console a couple months ago that took quite some time to repair. And it was a fairly basic issue. It was more of a secure default issue where if you launched a virtual machine and you skipped a particular step, it would say in the summary that no ports were open, but if you created the virtual machine, it would actually open up those administrative ports, which would be not great, you know. It's not maybe the end of the world, but the customer was misled about what ports were open. And after I think about seven months, they finally fixed the summary to say, oh no, if you skip this section by default, we're going to turn on the administrative ports for your operating system. Because again, we want to make things easier. Mm -hmm. But you know, these cloud providers make mistakes too, even the largest one. I've personally found an issue that I believe is a security issue. They didn't think it was that big a deal, clearly, but it is a security issue. And uh, they eventually remediated it, but people may have misconfigured things in the interim. So you have to be skeptical, but also just don't be more skeptical of the cloud providers than you are of these other software providers. I don't see any reason why XYZ uh, vendor is going to be more trustworthy. I, I would say they're less just because they have less eyes on them. So in our in our last hot, oh, I'm sorry, Jason. 
I was, I was just going to ask extension on that because that was a great for the provider. How does an organization then, when they're evaluating, because they're they're not, especially in the ICS space, they're not they're not talking to AWS. They're talking to a vendor that's utilizing AWS to run their application. How how do you extrapolate from that particular company that they are doing? When I'm listening, to what you're saying is it's a trust and verify, but that requires the app developer to like literally audit is it did this machine spin up the way I expected it to. Well, how, how does how does an end user evaluate whether somebody and you may not have a direct answer to this, but it's it's a problem, I think, because that tenant of that that's providing that solution to the end user. How do you evaluate that? That application developer to ensure that they're 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 doing what they can and not because it's I think a lot of times it's just it it's just seen like it's mystical magic and they just I run this application in AWS and cloud is secure okay but there's lots of layers as you described how how does somebody like is there is there a guide is there you know um, an audit checklist is there some kind of like method to, to evaluate the application company? So I don't have, as I mentioned before, a whole lot of experience in ICS, but I have a lot of experience as an application developer. You know, yeah. I've been a developer for longer than I've been in security. That's kind of how I got started in the technology space is I've been programming for a really long time. And, you know, through programming applications, I learned that there's a, a huge domain of securing these applications and that it's a valuable asset. So I've taken some SANS classes that got me into that space. So I would say that I'm actually more familiar with the development space and meeting the requirements of the customer. And I think the customer just needs to ask a lot of those same questions. What checks are you making in your cloud environment? Are you talking to the cloud vendor and doing the same analysis that we would expect if we were appropriating these cloud services ourselves? And also, what kind of continuous scanning are you doing in your cloud environment? There's a lot of tools that you can use to look for misconfigurations. Cloud Mapper, um, Cloud Custodian, uh, and then several native tools to the cloud provider like AWS Security uh, Hub and Azure has a security center, GCP has a analogous tool. Looking at your cloud environment consistently and uh, looking for issues and maybe have your vendor send you the results of that, those reports and have your folks analyze them. You know, there, There's a lot of data that they can generate for you that is objective so long as they don't tamper with it. And if you find that, that's a instant termination, potential legal situation that comes about. Um, but you can get a lot of information about the cloud. But of course, you also have to do just application security. And maybe you're not doing it firsthand, but you have to make sure that that company is doing application security, that they're actually analyzing their code for issues, maybe using static analysis, dynamic analysis, uh, code review, um, training, all the things that are involved in the secure development uh, lifecycle. So it's not just about the cloud, it's also about the application itself. And as someone who works for a vendor that is very popular uh, today and used in a lot of different environments, we approach uh, it in that exact way. We try to add security to all the parts of the secure development lifecycle. I personally am responsible for the application security training at Zoom and all of our developers are taking the training that I help put together and curate to make sure that as people are developing code for Zoom, they're thinking about security. And if you're not asking those same questions of these folks that you're relying on for your oil fields and electrical grids, it's time to start asking those questions. Yeah, I would. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Jeff. I was just going to say, so when I listen to Jason and his questions and I listen to Brandon and his statements and questions, um, it is a late, it's not only a layered software model, but it's also a layered personnel model. So the folks who are running what we keep saying oil fields, but let's say we're running toothpaste or we're running the grid or we're running anything is there's folks who understand the process and they understand what can make that unstable or unsecure. 
And so those people have to work with folks like Brandon or someone that can say, hey, let's make sure that not only the application and the tunnel to the cloud is secure, but let's make sure that that isn't going to affect the process. Because after all, we're trying to make a product at the end of the day. So it's, it's really baking into my mind that I can't walk this walk alone. We all need to move forward with our own specialties and work together as kind of a team. So, you know, when, when you, you mentioned Zoom, uh, but I also think about the, the Vergata incident. And the, the reason why that comes into mind is because we're talking about uh, environments that we're talking about vendors that might have multi-tenant environments and meaning that the data from uh, the clients uh, from their clients are all together. Uh, the access to that uh, administration for that are all together. And uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the Vercata incident, but basically a uh, credentials were compromised for one of their super administrators uh, that provided uh, access into their environment. And then that individual's credentials were able to access all of Vercata's uh, clients and interact with their cameras, uh, both on plant floors, um, uh, as well as uh, um, at a number of uh, locations. So is does uh, having a multi-tenant environment for your cloud infrastructure, should people be looking for um, uh, their data and their services to be individual to themselves? Or does it uh, um, should they be concerned about those multi-tenant services? Well, I think there's a more foundational problem for that breach that you're mentioning here, which is why is there anybody on this planet who can access all of these different cameras using a single set of credentials? That's really the issue there. I don't think any specific cloud control would have mitigated that because that's really just a poor usage of credentials. Now, in the cloud environment, we rely on identity access management and network controls in order to deal with the multi-tenancy of these different cloud providers. And that's the vast majority of services. The vast majority of services in the cloud are in fact multi-tenanted, but they are logically separated using these controls. So you are basically assuming that those network identity and access management controls that are provided by the cloud providers are working properly. And again, if they didn't work properly, you would have probably seen this by now because there's a huge incentive, not just for ethical hackers, but also nation states and other advanced persistent threats to find vulnerabilities that are that foundational. So with this assumption, if you use these controls properly, it doesn't matter uh, that these services are multi-tenant because logically you would not be able to access other tenants' data. That being said, this may be scary from an ICS perspective. I, I would push back a little bit on that because again, in the case of Verkata, they had a single set of credentials that allowed them to access all of these different tenants. And that's not something that I've ever heard of at the cloud provider level. But that also means that not everything belongs in the cloud. If you're scared of this multi-tenancy and it doesn't work out for compliance purposes, you have some options. You can put those things on premises or you can look at dedicated infrastructure for some of those types of services and data. For example, AWS and Azure both support dedicated hardware security modules or HSMs for their cryptographic keys. Uh, by default, you are going to be using a multi-tenant infrastructure if you're using AWS Key Management System, KMS, or Azure Key Vault. Uh, but if you need a dedicated HSM, they do provide that. It's really expensive. Uh, you really don't want to do it unless you have to. But for some organizations and compliance regimes, uh, it's worth it. So that's another option that you have in your tool belt. But some organizations are not going to accept having some infrastructure in the cloud at all. And at that point, you can say, okay, we don't have to put everything in the cloud. We can put some things in the cloud, or we can put some things in the cloud that interact with things on premises in a very controlled way that we can audit. Um, so there, there's a lot of options that the cloud providers provide to you. Yeah, I think that, that poses one of the early questions that needs to come up when, when a company is looking at adopting a new solution to do whatever. Um, 
is, you know, it's even just the question of, you know, if they need data from the plant floor, you know, the age old question that I have is how fast do you really need that data? Because that would essentially tell you how far down reaching does that cloud service need to extract the information. Um, and in other organizations, they, they you know, for, for cu their customers, clients or whatever, you know, they, they move the data out. And so they're just placing Feder or, you know, they move the data closer to the, instead of or closer to the cloud or to their customers than having them reach in and grab it for obvious reasons. Yeah. And I think add on to that in, in general, I would recommend pushing data as opposed to allowing for data to be pulled because if you allow data to be pulled by opening up ports, who knows what pivot points that can introduce. If there's a vulnerability on the device, now potentially you could have remote code execution and pivot throughout the network. So I would certainly hope that most vendors are publishing data as opposed to exposing it on a public endpoint. See, I think, and, and this is where, you know, so, so Jeff brought up the fact that uh, the decision makers or the, the people that are integrating this in the plant, they, you know, the, the, to them, IT, cloud, they're all mystical people. So if a vendor's coming in and they're providing a solution, the issue is that sometimes the vendor has pre-developed the solution, which is what you would expect, and pre-impose the methods on which these things need to connect in order to operate. And so the issue you run into is like, you could have somebody who's really internally really promoting this thing, but when you start doing an analysis, you identify, you know, it, this really is kind of a little over the top to what it needs to be. And it may be adding more risk than we really need if we were to develop ground up. So, you know, I think, you know, there's a kind of a chicken and egg because somebody came identified that there's a gap in the market. They're going to build an application and they're going to sell the application and they have their preconceived notion as to how it's going to work, how it's going to architect and how it will plug into the facility. And, you know, that kind of leaves end users in a position where it's like, well, if I really want to take advantage of that solution, because it will drive down my operating costs, it'll increase my productivity and all that, you know, they're, they're, they're kind of like, well, if I don't do it, I might, you know, lose. And so, you know, it's kind of like, how, I mean, it's not really a question specifically to you. It's a question as far as how is the cloud industry and, and everybody, like how are they trying to try, um, is there any movement to try to consider, you know, when they're architecting these solutions to try to encourage, you know, expect uh, I don't know, some level of flexibility or whatever to make it more uh, sizable or chewable for end users? I mean, I think that, we live in a world where there's competition and there's a lot of people that are trying to win that company's business. It seems to me like security is a very foundational feature set. It's something that really matters to the customer. And if you find that a vendor is not doing those things, other vendors exist. And this could be a great motivator to say, hey, you're going to lose our business unless you implement this using reasonable security uh, security standards. You know, I, I think that there's some leverage that can be uh, can be placed on these vendors. And if the company is saying, "Well, I want to use this anyway. I don't really care what the result of this audit is. I just want to use the software." Well, then they're probably wasting a lot of your time, and that's not a great thing for them to do either. If they're going to hire you to do uh, analysis of these vendors and how they could be integrated to the plant, they have to accept the possibility that the answer will be no, we cannot have this in our, uh, in our environment. And we have to evaluate other solutions or build our own solution. So I think that this is largely not a technological problem. I think it's largely a business and uh, you know, negotiation problem. Like if you're using some random vendor that doesn't do basic security things, like for example, it requires a port to be open on the public internet in order to support analytics. There's gotta be other vendors you can evaluate. That just doesn't seem acceptable to me. And I would never accept that. I, I, I agree. I think that what you brought up is, I think the, the other item is education because 
by the time it gets to the point where somebody's configuring the network to make that happen, the, the, the solution's already sold internally. It's so I think the education is that, you know, from, from our end, from the ICS community is, you know, plan managers, automation engineers, you know, people that are actually in charge of operations are asking, understand what questions to ask and how to have that conversation. Because I think a lot of them don't, they're just, they're, there's a, I find the industry in general, there's a lot of positive motivation to do good things and believing that people are there to help them, but they don't always, they're, they're a little passive in really hard asking hard questions that might, you know, take the energy out of the, uh, the room. So, so to me, well, why even ask the questions when they could hire you all to ask the questions? Why not get you <laughs> yeah, all sure. involved yeah. on the front end? It seems like, you know, I'm, I'm almost kind of incredulous that they're not doing this, you know, yeah. involve you all early on in the process, shift left. Yeah, to me, um, when you actually go boil a factory down, and I don't care what it is, there's, you know, receiving of raw goods, you put something together, you package it and you send it in most cases. Um, when you look at this, the smallest amount of work, like the indivisible cell, that's the thing you can't interrupt, whether you're making parts for an automobile or you're making food, eventually you get down to a point where there's autonomous control that's occurring and then there's everything else that's trying to provide visualization of what's going on in that process and data records of what happened. So what am I doing and what happened? And then at some point you can break that, you can break that down and you can say, um, I can insert a service here and go send or receive data from somewhere, whether it's office or whether it's one Purdue model higher or if it's a cloud. And so somebody needs to architect that. Architecture is very important. And when you say, hey, the cloud could either interrupt this process by not being available to make my data, like print a label or something, that's how you kind of architect this whole system. You say, I can't afford for a long hop or a hop to not be there to, in order to run a printer to slap a label to ship a thing. And so that's kind of how factories divide this out. And then eventually there's an insert, uh, uh, a logical insertion point of where cloud can actually enter this. And so that's kind of, kind of how I think about it. So, I mean, when, when I think about what you just said, uh, I think about a mentality that I think it's commonplace, commonplace within the industrial, which is that the set it and forget it, meaning that you get something in place, you set it up, you, you make it work, and now it's working, don't touch it. And I'm kind of afraid that there, people are gonna take that approach with the cloud, where this is information that is going across an enforcement boundary. We are sending information to the cloud that other, uh, to network infrastructure, to equipment that other people are responsible for, whether it's a service or whether it's uh, that uh, um, uh, cloud provider. And that you, you can't forget it. You, you have to periodically come back and evaluate the configuration because things change over time, especially if your organization isn't managing it. You need to understand what decisions people are making. And that, require, that requires a periodic analysis, review, and assessment of that connectivity, considering that it's, an enforce, it's information uh, access across an enforcement boundary. Yeah. yeah I, we, sorry. I was well, just throw- speaking to uh, Don is um, they did. I think what it means is that there's, there's another tier to managing this. So if, if the plant identifies a benefit to a solution, there may be a model where they just go ahead and they sign it and sign up and then they pay for it and everything else. But what you're bringing up is an important element that I think, you know, would be a service that, you know, the IT organization or department may be able to support. And that is the ongoing auditing to make sure that all the, all the chess pieces are where they're supposed to be and moving in the right direction. Because I think to your point, automation folks, and this isn't a slam to them is, you know, like they'll put a visualization system in it's working great. They move, they, they wait for it. It's, and then they move to more of a break fix mentality. 
they're not really in some ways. Yeah. They'll do some preventive maintenance and so forth, but they're not really set up to audit and scrutinize and maintain that relationship between the cloud organization and, and, and themselves. So I just want to put that in there that there's, there's another element that needs to be brought to the table when these decisions are made. Absolutely. And uh, I can definitely say you do not want to set it and forget it. You absolutely want to maintain it, continuously audit it. Uh, there are so many things that can change over time or things that don't change that are now considered to be vulnerable through the discovery of zero-day dependencies or dependencies with zero days, I should say. I used to think as a developer uh, growing up, I used to think that code was kind of like art. You develop it once and then you can hang it on the wall and it just works. But now as I learn more about security, especially about component analysis, I think of code as a vehicle. Vehicles break down with use. Over time, things become obsolete. You'll find that a component that is in that vehicle is now on a recall and you need to um, replace it. And I mean, there's an entire area of study in security about component analysis, not just cloud components, but also software components. And if you're using all of these cloud services and your vendor is not doing that kind of analysis, looking at the components that your application is built out of, using static analysis to look for actual issues in the code, doing proper code reviews to find business logic issues that these tools can't find, doing dynamic analysis in order to find issues at a higher level, SQL injection, cross-site scripting, missing headers, looking at the cloud configuration in which all of this exists. And that has like 70 different subtopics when it comes to networking, identity, access management, key, key management, uh, you know, containerization versus virtual machines, serverless is a new thing, uh, multi-cloud integration. I mean, the list goes on. You can't just set it and forget it. You need to have someone, even if it's a third party, consistently auditing this and then giving you the reports that you can then use to take action. And if you're not doing that, then don't be surprised when your car breaks down. Good point. Well, uh, I, I think that uh, we've covered a lot of great information and I, I, Brandon, I really appreciate uh, you joining us uh, to do this. Uh, what I'd like to do is kind of uh, um, go around and uh, get some uh, last minute thoughts. So Jason, you know, uh, anything uh, you want to bring up before we? I think, it, you know, kind of recapping, yeah, we, we covered a lot, but I think the thing is, is that um, I, I, I don't want to say I'm neither for nor against cloud uses in in ICS I am from from the standpoint of you know ICS organizations have to stay competitive they have to look at ways of reducing cost and um, but the thing is is that we can't they, they they just it's not something I've done in a blind manner and it and as just in this last conversation was brought up you know there there it's it's you may be offloading the management of the infrastructure but you are onboarding a lot more process and procedure from an organization that I think is heavily overlooked in the ICS space when they start going around a conference and they're seeing all these fancy finagled things that they could utilize. And I think that that's, you know, that amongst with evaluating the risk they need to, you know, truly understand is something that's worth their organization. Jeff? Yeah, um, for me, cloud is not evil. Um, but it has to be inserted at the right spot. And I'm a big, how do I keep my factory working kind of guy. And at the end of the day, companies are in business to make a product at a profit and um, analytics and different insertion from cloud technologies will help us, but it has to be at the right level. So, and, and in my experience in the last uh, two years have been that, you know, uh, while some people are accepting this, uh, there's a, still a lot of organizations that are saying no cloud whatsoever. We can't have a touch in our control network. And me personally, I think that's, you know, uh, putting your head in the sand. You, you need to, even if you're not going to allow it, you need to have a plan for it. You need to understand that, the, that some vendors are going to start requiring that. So start thinking about it now. Start understanding it now, getting your teams to wrap your head around it. And uh, so you're prepared for those vendors that are going to say, hey, now these things need to uh, connect up here. 
So uh, Brandon, uh, once again, uh, you know, uh, anything that you'd like to leave uh, the audience with, sir? Absolutely. To continue on Jason's point, uh, it seems really interesting to me that in a traditional software organization that is not working uh, with all of these on-premises uh, pieces of infrastructure, usually the move from on-premises to the cloud is more about giving up responsibility. People are uncomfortable outsourcing all this configuration, all of this management to the cloud. It seems like in the ICS space, going to the cloud is introducing more responsibilities that the plant managers are not necessarily even thinking about. And I think this is really potentially exposing a problem that existed outside of just the cloud, the reliance on vendors and taking vendors at their word in terms of how their software works. Cause you know, you're using network controls in order to compensate for potentially catastrophic issues with the software itself. But there's a lot of damage that can be done even on a private network hopping from one device that is not connected on the internet to potentially one that is. And there's a lot of things that can go wrong if you're not doing proper software security. So it seems to me like the cloud is exposing issues that the ICS community needs to reckon with sooner or later, regardless of whether or not they put their data on the cloud. But I think that when you can rely on a vendor like the different cloud providers that we have here that are operating at such a unbelievably tremendous scale, you can actually reduce a lot of the work, reduce a lot of the things that you have to think about. You, do, you can take for granted that identity and access management is going to work if you configure it properly. You can take for granted that network controls are going to be working properly if you configure it correctly. Etc. But you have to be familiar with how these mechanisms work and especially how these mechanisms differ from the different cloud providers. So SANS has a cloud security curriculum now that you can learn more about at sans.org slash cloud dash security. And it'll talk to you about all of the free resources we have as well as all of the courses that we provide. My course, SEC 510 Public Cloud Security, AWS, Azure, and GCP is really focused on teaching you the differences between these three cloud providers because there's a lot of differences in the methodology and the implementation of these different clouds. It's not like they invented the cloud with a standard in mind. No, they're all doing things very, very differently. And if you learn one cloud provider, you can't necessarily take that skill set and export it to another one. So by taking this course, you can understand not only all of those controls that I've mentioned to you today and more, but also how those controls differ from the different cloud providers. So I really hope that you'll check out the SANS cloud security curriculum. There's a lot of great resources out there that can help you get started. Awesome. Well, I appreciate everybody's time today. Thank you for joining us to, uh, for, to talk about the uh, cloud and ICS. Have a great day. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you for tuning in to this ICS Hot Take with the SANS ICS team. If you'd like to join the SANS ICS community, please check the show notes for links to the community and other resources provided by the SANS ICS team. If you have comments about this topic, please add them to the comments below or reach out to the SANS ICS community. If you'd like to see more content like this, please like and subscribe to the SANS ICS channel. Thank you and have a great day.